Dink, 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 dink. Oh, I, 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 Welcome back to the Jenna Julian Podcast, a.k.a. the Disturbed Podcast, a.k.a. the... What? 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 Oh, uh, uh, it's disturbed. <laughs> Down with the sickness. This uh, week, we have wonderful MeUndies. Guys, you've heard me talk about MeUndies over and over and over again. It's the only underwear I wear. Okay. If you haven't tried them, I don't know what in the world you're waiting for, but it better be good. <laughs> Mandy's sends incredible underwear with sustainably made, uh, sustainably sourced material from beechwood trees right to your door, so you don't have to do anything. Beach you just wood. open your door. Beech. Beechwood trees. Wait, why don't I hear you? I don't know. Can you hear you? A little bit. It's quiet. Ooh, let me hold on. Hold. Oh, we hold in. Oh. Beach. Oh, that's bad. Be- oh, there we go. It's better. Oh. I'll t- I'll share a funny story about why we're still doing this janky setup. Uh, guys, 20% off your first pair of MeUndies, free shipping and satisfaction guarantee when you go to MeUndies.com. That's M-E-U-N-D-I-E-S.com slash Jenna Julian. Treat yourself. You will not be sorry, honestly, guys. Also, wink. Yo, got to say, <laughs> lately we've been drinking a lot of wine. <laughs> wine dinosaurs. And wink, we are wine We're dinosaurs. wine dinosaurs. Wink makes it so much easier to enjoy the wine that you love but didn't know about before wink came into your life. Guys, it's spelled W-I-N-C, Okay. They make it easier to dis- discover new wine because experts from Wink select wine match to your taste when you fill out a taste flavor profile and they ship it to your door. Mm-hmm. And it starts with just $13 a bottle. Okay. You can't beat the price. Um, and you should definitely give it a try because the, the wine that you're going to discover is limitless and also something that you could probably never have found by yourself mm-hmm. because you don't work for Wink. And you don't even have to think about it. You just got Winosaur at your door. Mm-hmm. Winosaur at your door. Um, anyway. We've been drinking a lot of wine because we have, like, space to keep bottles of wine in the house. And it's so nice. I, like, I've always liked to drink wine. You like yeah, we've never had... We've whiskey. never had... Well, I like wine, too. Yeah, you've been drinking wine. Yeah, it's really good. I'm so proud of you. Isn't it good? <laughs> it's, good. it's good, yeah. <laughs> Why would you just look at me like that? <clears throat> I don't know. It's so nice to just like have a glass of wine and be like, this is tasty. I agree with you. Wine is good. I like and the cold white wine. I like some yeah, nice Yeah, you know what? I want, I want to like, I want to, I want to start branching out. Hey, Wink, let's get a little adventurous here. Oh, why are you talking to her like that? The fuck dog? The fuck dog? <laughs> <clears throat> Um, I don't know how the audio is for right now. It's it's super frustrating. Let me tell just share. us what's happening, Julian. <coughs> okay, when you move, there are quite literally hundreds of things that you don't think about um, setting up or taking care of or um, creating ways to you know have the existing amenities in your life fit your new house, whether. Whether, you know, whatever your interests are, like you're, there's cable, there's the basic stuff. It's like cable, power, all that. And then there's a whole nother level of shit like, you know, um, what services are we going to need or, what, you know, where's our, what's our um, grocery routine or whatever. There's like a million things that are happening. One of the things um, when we moved was, okay, we were separating the podcast in the stream room. So we needed to like change our equipment setup. So we needed to order a PC for the podcast because just like a basic PC to, you know, record the audio. So we're not doing it off of. A little sound recorder. So I ordered this PC and because there's a hundred things going on and I'm getting Mm -hmm. emailed about this and that, you know, every day, I missed an email. I don't know how I missed it, (laughs) but I missed an email that came at the beginning of May, like right when we were moving. And what did it say? The email said, Dear Julian. Dear God. Solomita. No, it said, hello, beach. Hello. It said, um... Basically, like, because we our shipping address was different than our billing address, which I'm sure a lot of you guys have tried buying things with that situation and before, like, and no a lot beach. of companies don't like that. No me. So they were like, "Oh, because your billing address is different than your shipping address, we can't ship your order. We can't ship your PC. It's already built, but we can't we can't ship it to you." And I missed that. So a We've month just been goes sitting by, sitting around waiting for this PC. I to just come. think it's gonna arrive. <laughs> like, like I'm man, not... this sure is taking a long time. <laughs> so I like literally like three days ago, I go into my email. I'm like, you know what? I wonder what the status is with that. And I find literally to the date, it was like like May 17th or something like that. I checked it on June 17th, 
or some shit or 15th or whatever. And I was like, you, um, so I responded, I was like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry for the delay. Can you please send it to our billing address or whatever? And, um, they're like, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the window has passed. You didn't respond in time. The order has been canceled. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. Sick. Oh Thanks. my God. No, <laughs> no, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Uncancel um, it. So I, um, you might need to talk a little closer to your mic. I'm not I sure how it sounds for you. Beach. But, um, basically I was like, please, please, can you please give me, you know, make the order happen before it cancels? Because otherwise if we had to redo the whole order, it would take so many more weeks. And luckily, the customer service came in clutch. So they're sending it so now. So they're sending it now. But so we're gonna have a, a setup in here soon. That's what. Oh my god. That's the idea. We'll see if it actually happens. I don't know. I kind of doubt that it's gonna. I honestly feel like we're gonna be carting off that thing for a year. That's possible. I don't even know how to operate that. I don't know how you do that. You're wild. Um, no, it's easy to operate. It's just it's like not convenient for certain things. You're basically wild and out of control. Okay. Yeah. You're a wine dinosaur. I am a wine dinosaur. A winosaur. 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 Can you tell me what this is that we're doing? Julian was like, hey, for the podcast, you want to play a game called Mommy Can I Kill Go and Go Out and Kill Tonight? Is that what it is? What? Like what is it? So I want I just felt in the mood to play some sort of like adventure oh. or choose your own choice adventure games online because I think those are really fun. Um, and they make for good content when you're listening to podcasts. Because I've been listening to more podcasts lately. Fun. I have. And um, I want to try to like do stuff that I want to listen to. You know, So I, th- I feel like a choose your own story is a good idea. So I found this website called chooseyourstory.com. Ooh. Play, create, share your own story games. So this is like a basically a hub for if you want to play all sorts of different themed story games, if you want to post your story games, uh, if you want to rate them, if you want to review them. There's it's It's kind of like... A big deal. Um, and I was searching like apo- apocalyptic, like survival ones. And I was like, oh, that's cool. But then I found this one that said, Mommy, can I go out and kill tonight? <laughs> and immediately I was I was captivated I'm by that title. I'm ready. What? How does it work? It is a modern adventure by Mag- Mad Glee. That's the name of the user who made it. I can read the background and the features. But basically, um, you start it and then each moment um each step or whatever you're presented with options okay. of what to do and you're choosing each option which at the end of the story will determine how you how you fared i'm ready um this story contains graphic violence and sexual images as all kinds of situations oh my use. god so it's just a normal jenna julian podcast oh my god uh you were a good boy <gasps> But then you turn bad. No, I'm still a good boy. Drug addict, cop, mm. cop killer, manipulator. <gasps> These are all names you could be called. But Leon helped you hide the evidence and you were never caught for your crimes. Oh my God. You, who were once so far gone, yourself, now help others. You take care of them when no one else will. And yet the creature who, who first strayed from the path of righteousness has not fully disappeared. It is still part of you. A dark psychosis psychosis threatening to get out. You sometimes hear its voice at night whispering while you try to fall asleep. An eternal battle between the dark and the light rages within your mind. Which side will you listen to during the most crucial of days? I feel raging. It's like kind of like The Wolf Among Us, isn't it? It does feel like The Wolf Among Us. All right, I'm ready. This is an advanced game where you create a character, choose four of seven unique traits, and distributing 100 points between your three stats however you see fit. These stats, do it. I don't need to do that whole thing. Let's, let's just play. Let's just do it. Play, <gasps> mommy, comma, can I go out and kill tonight? Why are we talking to our mommy like that? Mommy. 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 <laughs> Julian, I swear okay. to God. Before you, read, before you begin the story, you need to create a character. Character has three statistics and four traits. If this is your first time reading this story, please read all the directions carefully before choosing. Yeah, yeah, we'll probably skip them. Um, if you've read this story before, feel free to create your character without reading any of this. Okay, statistics. The stats are endurance, intellect, and luck. You may modify these in any way you choose with the points you are given. But remember, endurance must always be at least 10. Every stat is important and will play a part throughout the story. Endurance. This stat represents your overall health. While combat is not the only feature in the story, it certainly plays a role. A character with an endurance of 10 is a pale, sickly creature who needs only to be hit in the face to be knocked unconscious or killed. 
character with a hundred endurance, it's pretty difficult to kill outright, but you can still die or be in, incapacitated depending on the player's choices. If your endurance ever reaches zero, you will die and the story will be over. Oh. Endurance directly influences the traits of weapon master and healer and plays a role with the trait of bruiser. Intellect. This stat represents how smart you are. Intelligence involves memory, cog- cognition, uh, knowledge, and among other things. A character with an intellect of 10 is a complete moron, barely able to multiply 5 by 10. A character with a 100 intellect can do advanced calculus equations in his or her head while discussing astrophysics. Uh, intellect will never change throughout the story, although when uh, while the stat will not obviously kill you by reaching zero, it plays a significant role in your success or failure in many actions throughout the story. Intellect mm-hmm. directly influences the traits of the pharmacist, diplomat, and the role with the trait of psychic. <clears throat> luck. This stat represents how lucky you are. Luck it plays a mysterious role throughout the story but should not be disregarded as unimportant. Many times in the story... <clears throat> Uh, sorry, many times the story will roll a random number without your knowledge and luck will play a crucial role in the outcome. So there's RNG involved. Um, a character with 10 luck is so unlucky that even when he walks outside his house, he's likely to be run down by a truck. A character with a hundred luck can nearly do anything without fear of reprisal. Um, however, every time you specifically use your luck, the stat will decrease. Uh -uh. So it has a lifespan. This is a very important point to remember. Luck directly influences the traits of street smart and psychic and plays a role with the trait of bruiser. It also plays a small role with every other trait. Okay, now we pick our trait. <coughs> we can only pick four. <clears throat> okay, you may only pick four. Bruiser, you are extremely strong. When given the choice, you will hit much harder when you hit someone in combat. However, this strength comes with a recklessness that will cause your strikes to be slightly less accurate. While not dominated by any statistic, both luck and endurance play a part when using this trait. Diplomat. You know how to talk fast, articulately, and equally good, and you are equally good in persuading and bluffing others. This trait can get you out of many difficult situations. Diplomacy is not the same as street smart and will not always work with those you might consider undereducated. Intellect is most important when using this trait. Healer. You're able to heal yourself by regaining lost endurance points. You cannot use this trait whenever you want, but it can be invaluable during parts of the story when you have chance, you have a chance to regain your lost endurance. Endurance is most important when using this trait. Uh, pharmacist. You can identify any pharmaceutical or herb, including illegal substances. This knowledge gives you the upper hand when figuring out a particular sub- whether a particular substance is dangerous, benign, or even useful in situations you might not otherwise be able to determine. Intellect is most important when using this trait. Sixth sense. You are able to, uh, you are extremely intuitive, uh, in many situations when the right choice is not clear. Your sixth sense will enable you to pick correctly, avoiding many unpleasant outcomes. Furthermore, you can determine other players, uh, uh sorry, you can determine another's intentions far more easily, such as when they are lying or wish you harm. Luck is most important when using this trait, but intellect plays a part. Street smart, you know how to get around the urban sprawl without getting conned, mugged, or outright beaten. Utilizing skills you have learned from a long stay in New York City, and you can talk your way or fight your way out of many situations in St. Louis that you will otherwise have to face. Um, street smart is not the same as diplomat, but it will always work um, with those you might consider educated. Luck is most important using this trait. Weapon master. You're an expert with wep- any weapon you come upon. Uh, in addition to your already expert hand-to-hand training, any weapon you wield, be it a katana or a pencil, will become deadly in your hands. Endurance is most important using this trait. Okay. Um, it is also important to note that there are four statistics you cannot choose or change. These are the, your level of psychosis, your what? psychedelic state, your level of sobriety, and score will what? all be modified depending on your choices throughout the story. So those are out Whoa. of your control. Okay. All right. So let's pick. All right. We we'll create tricks. our character. Okay. Oh, this is cool. You just like. Okay. What are you doing? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So. Why don't um, we talk about our traits? What kind of traits you want, and then we'll divvy up our endurance and intellect and okay. luck. Um, I think that w- if we do something physical, something using our brain, and then something like sixth sense or healer or pharmacist, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I say weapon master is a little better than bruiser because weapon master only requires endurance, and bruiser requires luck and endurance, and there's also a downside to bruiser, which is your 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 kind of shots wild. Miss. yeah yeah so i say weapon master for a physical what um okay that sounds good weapon master yeah wait 
You need to go back. What happened? Wait, what? Oh, I accidentally. Okay, so we have to. We have to do the traits first. Oh shit! Okay. Otherwise, it'll just end the story. Okay. Okay, so we have to. Yeah, that was the problem. All right, endurance. So see, it says it must be at least ten to continue. So we need endurance plus ten. Okay, so endurance is ten. Um, we, okay, but we have a hundred points. Right? I know. I think we have to divvy them up before we okay. pick the traits. Go for it. Um. Okay, so let's do intellect ten. Mm-hmm. Uh, luck ten. Mm-hmm. But but just think about our traits and then you'll add them onto there. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So scroll down. I'd say for weapon master that requires endurance. So we're probably looking at spending at least thirty points into endurance. Cool. Let's add ten more. So we'll get thirty endurance. And then I think they should be relatively even, right? Yeah. Thirty, thirty, thirty. Want to just least. do that? Yeah, and then we'll add a little more to what we think. Making a pretty balanced person, Beach. Yeah, we're super balanced. You know. I mean, this isn't really how I would divvy up my champion points in Elder Scrolls. Okay, so we have 10 extra points. Where do we put them? Um, well, just, We're 30, 30, 30. Hold here. on. We gotta, why don't you go down and look at the traits so we can pick them? But not you, you don't have to click on them. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. I know. So you can calculate. Um, luck and endurance. So No, we're not I doing know, I know. I'm just looking. I say diplomat is pretty good. Healer is pretty Sorry. I can't really hear you. You're talking to the side of your mic. I'm sorry. Do you want to play the game yes, or what? Yes, I just need to be able to hear you. Go on. Diplomat's pretty good. Healer's pretty good. Pharmacist, six cents. Street smart. I'd say six cents is valuable. Pharmacist is valuable. Healer. Okay. I don't know. Don't so we say? definitely need endurance. So that's. I'd say it looks like most of those are on luck and intellect. The thing is about endurance is it decreases throughout the story. So use luck and intellect. Or you're saying we need more endurance. I would say we need more endurance. Okay. So, so that because we're preparing for it to just go down. Why don't you go 40, 30, 30? We can also add by ones too. Okay. 35. All right. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Now we have five points left. Let's do two luck, three intellect. How's that? Yeah, that's good. Two, three, done. Okay. Um, so weapon master. Yep. Um, what was the other one? Uh, six cents or street smart. Why don't you pick one? Let's do diplomat. Okay. So we have diplomat, weapon master. Six cents, I'd say, or street smart. I like this because he uses both. Okay. And then I'd say either healer or pharmacist. All right, let's do healer. Okay. Okay. So we're, we have everything picked. Character created. Cool. Let's do it, beach. Where do we go now? Okay. Sorry. Um, when you're finished, click. Character created, begin the background. Do you have more points to add or something? Um, I don't know. I, <laughs> this needs to equal 100 to continue, right? Mm -hmm. Minus. Huh, this is weird. Let me see. 100 out of 100. This needs to equal 100 to continue. Why don't you hit save? Or you're at 110 right now. Yeah, no. Where, where's save? Up at the top right. Okay. Oh, no. It's it's like won't let us go, go through. Um... Save. Okay. Sorry. Um, do you want to? Sorry. Um, okay. Intellect. Let's try to. I don't know. I don't know why it's doing this. This is weird. You're still at 110. I know, but like it doesn't. Um... All right. We figured it out. Time to go. Um, begin the background. Right? Yep. 
You weren't always a problem child. Until age 15, you were the epitome of good. Straight A's, no mind-altering substances, and a full scholarship mm-hmm, to a private high school. That's right. No, that part's not right, but okay. Mm. Depends. Beach. Uh, however, you hated nearly everyone around you, so you transferred to a public school, used your Word. Uh, intellect to assimilate in the in-crowd's values, your good looks to charm the women, and started using oh, drugs and alcohol. Oh, ladies. Whoa. Every hot girl in your school liked you. Every jock hated Whoa. you, but goddamn, they respect you. You smoked weed by day and fucked a different cheerleader by <gasps> night. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. This story is graphic. You were a god. Oh, my God. College came and went in a blur, but you scored straight, straight A's. In those years, the drugs got harder and your friends got rougher. Trouble came with two cops trying to bust you for possession and distribution, but you took care of that. Handcuffed them with their own tools and shot them both in the back of the head. Oh, my God. Your friend Leon Shoots helped. both bad guys. Jason Derulo. Go ahead. Your friend Leon helped you dispose of their corpses. What? Neither of you were ever caught. Years passed and you became a shell of your former self, shooting heroin and cocaine, intent on nothing but blissful oblivion. You almost died. Your brother saved you from this hell and your mind convulsed with the revelation and possibility of self actualization returning to school you got a doctorate in science specializing in psychiatry psychiatry and nursing uh you were so far who were so far gone now help people you take care of them and no one else will and even when uh and even want are you okay what what do you mean (laughs) what what are you talking about no just go ahead i'm just reading i know um and yet the first sorry and yet the guy who first strayed from the path of righteousness we already read all that okay All right, to which side will you listen during this most crucial of days? All right, wake up. It's our only choice. we got to wake up. I'm ready to wake up. Something awakens you. You're not sure what something is. It doesn't matter. All that matters is you're awake. It's 9 on a Friday morning, and you have rounds at the hospital. Stacy is lying beside you, her arms slung across your chest, and moans as you surreptitiously attempt to free yourself without waking her. Noon, you stride to your bathroom and throw up, throw yourself... (laughs) Throw yourself into the shower. Hot water blasts your face and invigorates you. You soap up and try to forget you got maybe four hours of sleep. Most of the night, a vague recollection. Images of creep uh, unbidden into your consciousness. Images of creep. Images of creep. That's a weird sentence. Stacy bent over uh, on the bed on the balls of her feet, you thrusting into her. Oh, my God. <gasps> Don't read any of that. Don't read any. That is porn. <gasps> Oh, yeah. I'm oh, actually, my God. I'm actually going to skip that. That's so extra. Wow. You finish showering, dry off with a fluffy green bath towel, and put in new contact lenses. That is lenses. porn. Take 15 milligrams <laughs> of uh, bussy, bu- busperone, 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 I don't know, busperone, and a multivitamin. Brush your teeth and get a drink of water. Cover the tattoos with a tailor-made uh, $1,000 black pinstripe soup. And bright lime green silk tie. Stacy opens her eyes momentarily, smiles sleepily, then shifts her to her stomach and pulls the covers over her head. Bring home some leather restraints. You hear her mumble. You laugh outright. Um, okay. Now we have the options to enter the kitchen, enter the computer room, enter the bathroom, go to work. Well, we got to go to work. Let's just skip it all. Go to work. Yeah. Going it's time to, to go to work, beach. Leaving your house, you lock the front door and smile ruefully at the back at the black 2005 Son, uh, Scion XA. You've customized the thing with tinted windows and a bazooka subwoofer, sure. Oh, we're a shit, huh? Yeah, we sound like the worst person ever. Um, it's small and not the fastest car in the world, but it gets 36 miles a gallon, handles great, and you could parallel park the thing anywhere, all for 13,000 measly bucks. Some people think your 6'3", 170-pound frame is a bit too big for the ride, but they're wrong. Comfortable and stable gets you where you need to go. <coughs> to the right of your apartment, there's a walkway which leads to a dumpster in the alley. You hope you didn't forget anything because you won't be coming back here for quite a while. We can drive to the hospital, go back inside, or follow the walkway. I don't want to go to a dumpster in the alley. You didn't. You hope you didn't forget anything. Okay. So well, we just go to the hospital. Let's go to the hospital. Right, go to the work. I don't want to go to a dumpster. I'm a douchebag and I'm wearing a very expensive suit mm-hmm. that just did porn. We didn't do porn. I did porn. We didn't do it. <laughs> we just really graphically described our night. Okay, keep going. You guys must, you should be happy we didn't read that. <laughs> it was a lot. You're on the road doing 40 down King's Highway. You pass a quick trip on your right, Uncle Bill's Pancake House on your left, and a multitude of car dealerships on both sides. Uh, highway 40 is coming up fast. You signal, you merge, you accelerate to 65. Nice. King the stereo. Um, 
to your favorite 90s music, Confessions of a Knife, the thrills, uh, the thrill kill cults first album comes on, you left, uh, as you hear the sample, Joanne, Joanne, bitch, I'm going to find her and I'm going to kill her, blaring through the car, and a standard 200 watt surround system, the subwoofer you added in the small interior to allow music to resonate, filling you with sound. All of that is extra. Glancing in the rearview mirror, you see red and blue flashing lights. Motherfucking pigs, you inadvertently mutter, pulling you over, um, pulling over for, and wait for the cop to approach. Okay. Are you in Are, an, You have one choice. It's just be in an agitated state of mind. Let's get agitated. All right, we're agitated. You watch the cop in your rearview mirror. He's talking to his radio, calling in your car. Images return. You, the handcuffed cops. They first pleading and bargaining. Then going silent as you fire the 45 semi auto point blank into the back what? of their heads. He's flashback to when he killed the cop. Oh, God. Oh, okay. I was like, this escalated so fast. What is going on? Quarter size holes in the posterior skull, fragmented anterior explosions above the right eye. Half their faces gone instantly. Okay. Pieces of brains sprayed about the black ground. Yeah. Bright red. Red blood fl- splashing onto the pavement like Jack, like a Jackson Pollock painting. Dark ah! red afterwards sleeping. Oh my God, this is so graphic. All right. The, the sudden realization that you killed another human and not any human, a fucking cop. Judges and juries tend to execute cop killers. You were afraid. The dis- disturbing thing is that fear outweighed any guilt you might have otherwise felt. But what about the children? If cops can get up, um, if cops can get it up, oh my God, can they even procreate? Did the innocents wonder about their dad's absence? Um, did they di- conceive of horrible realities their tiny minds couldn't verbalize? Did they simply ask eyes wide with puckered cheeks, where's daddy? Isn't he coming home, mommy? Dad? Oh, my God. Jeez. What can she really say? That's our only choice. Why don't you tell them what the choices are? <coughs> the choice is what can she really say? Okay. Her answer. Wait, this is, so this is all just like him and his mind. I don't know. Okay. Frayed robe clenched to her body, her, the significance that her husband didn't call to say he was going late, um, perverse thoughts that she married a fucking cop, realization that the kind of, this kind of shit was bound to happen, meant to happen, maybe even if she asked for it, doomed her kids by accepting the late hours, the violence, the danger, but how could she respond? No PD, he's not. Uh, daddy, daddy finally enforced the law in the wrong place at the wrong time, fucked with the wrong person, his vanity and overconfidence precluded basic self-preservation and caution. Uh, and so he died a brutal death. There'll be a funeral with guns fired into the air and unison salutes the whole uh, hackneyed sh- uh, fucking shebang. He'll be the male child standing next to the casting like um, like a perverse colored recreation of John John and Jack. Live with it. I always have. And the memory of the corpse is slowly sinking beneath the putrid waters of the East River, their eyes glassy, staring at you with unspoken accusation. The abruptness of their of these uh, unbidden images startles you and you and induces emotional nausea. Nausea. Um, can this pig see into your soul? Irrational nonsense, you think, wiping a bead of sweat from your forehead. Well, I want this prick. Hurry up. So that was all just like him living, like reliving all of that in his head when he got pulled over. Why well, I want this prick. Hurry up. You wonder, I'm late. I'm late. I'm late. You feel yourself getting angry, angry both off of nervousness and a basic loathing, basic loathing for authority. This bastard is going to make you late and you did nothing. You feel like telling him to piss off. So you can either wait for the cop to approach or speed away and try to lose his ass. Let's get live. Come on. Can we please speed? All right. Speed away. Go ahead. Really? I thought I would get more pushback. There's only two choices. Like, I would wait for the cop, but if you want to speed away, let's speed away. You're a dangerous Aries. Do what you want. See, this is, this is, this is bound to happen. What? We come to a head here where there's an Aries choice and there's a Virgo choice. Mm. Go ahead. Speed away. Shoving the stick stick shift into first, you gun it. The scion moves forward, but not with any high-pitched whine uh, or low growl you'd expect from a sports car. Rather, it sort of eases into traffic. Acceleration is almost nil. Nevertheless, you manage to hit 85 before three car, cop cars are right behind you. Sirens wailing and their red and blue lights reflecting off your mirrors. Your laden foot slams down on the gas and the scion crawls to 100 after about 20 seconds. One squad car pulls up to your left. The other two remain behind you. You glance over and see the cop is grinning. What do you do? Do you turn hard, smashing your car into his? Pull over and give up? If you wish to use your sixth sense trait, click here. Ooh. Ooh. This is, you got us into this mess. All right, let's use our sixth sense trait. Okay, go for it. Your intuition tells you two things. First, the cop is a better driver than you. Second, your car is much smaller, lighter, and more fragile than his. Trying to smash him would be very, very, very foolish and probably result in your death. However, the decision is yours to make. 
well, now you can either pull over or smash his car. That didn't really help. It did. Because if we had smashed, we would have died. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Pull over and give up. Good thing we sped away. Right, Am I right, ladies? Enough, you think. There's no possible way you can outrun these cops. So you may as well pull over and get what's coming to you. You pull over. Now we're in extra trouble, Julian. It was worth the attempt. Ugh. You shut off the engine. The cop that was to your left squeals to a stop in front of your car. The two behind you pull up next to you and directly behind, respectively. All three cops get out of their cars, guns drawn, and descend upon you. Hands on the wheel, motherfucker. The first one shouts. You obey. The cops open the door, grab you by the neck, throwing you onto the pavement. We didn't need to do this. The cops surround you. You impatient Aries. Your prone body and scream in unison. Don't move. You stay absolutely still. They begin bludging you with their nightsticks and yelling. He's trying to escape. You'd be baffled by this behavior if you weren't quickly approaching unconsciousness. When the beatings finally end, they handcuff you and Officer Piles roughly searches your battered, battered flesh. He finds, doesn't find anything. That's the only choice. Officer Piles frisks you and finds nothing more of value to him. You want wonder... What the hospital, not to mention the doctors, will think when you start showing up for late rounds. He, uh, he starts writing a ticket. Ooh, a ticket. The least of your worries. Okay. That's our only option. An $80 ticket. Oh, we can look at it. Oh, I, ke I kept it. An $80 ticket. You're going to have to call your attorney and pay him 200 to fix this thing. Okay. Get arrested? That's our only choice. That's our only choice. It says get arrested. All right. So now we're arrested. This is crazy. Are you, are you feeling like this is crazy? I feel like we didn't need to get arrested. Satisfied and sweating profusely, mm -hmm. Officer Piles pulls you, and, pulls you up and leads you to a squad car. He roughly pushes you in and your head smashes against the roof. After that beating, you almost pass out from that last blow. You're under arrest for leaving the scene and resisting arrest. You have the right to suck my cock when I ask and the right to get your teeth kicked in if, if you refuse. They seem like good cops. Cool. I gave you the option. Keep going. You remain wisely silent. Perhaps you've been impulsive enough for one day. The handcuffs are chafing your wrists. The cop gets back on the highway, makes a U-turn, gets off, taking you to the Richmond Heights Police Station. Do you sit there and wait for the inevitable or thrash about wildly screaming obscenities no. and taunts? No more Aries decisions. I don't know. I mean, it might cause some sort of distraction, <clears throat> you know? Stop it. That's disgusting. I don't want to flail in the back of a cop car. Okay, fine. I'll sit there and wait for an inevitable. Good. We sit there and wait. You did this. Officer Piles shoves you into the station, causing you to stumble momentarily. Your earlier rage has been supplanted by fear of the unknown, and you've never actually been arrested. The cop takes off your handcuffs, and you feel relieved. You rub your sore wrists and try to get the red lines to go away. He grabs your hand and starts fingerprinting you. First your thumb, then all your fingers. A phone rings, and you hear a dispatcher in another room call out the location of a crime. You're, you survey your surroundings. Besides officer piles, no one else is present. There are a bunch of cubicles through a door to your left, a row of holding cells to your right, and a break room straight ahead. Fing finish fingerprinting you, officer piles grabs your arm and starts walking to the holding cells. You think you have a good chance of shaking him and running off, so you choose maybe even gaining tangible goods in the process, but you get a little more, but you may get a little more psychotic. All right, you have four options here, five options. You try to break free, free and run to the cubicles. Do you try to break free and run to the break room? Do you try to break free and run to the holding cells or do you try to break free and run to the exit or you can let them lead you to the holding cells? <coughs> Initial thoughts here. Follow the rules. But there's four options. Okay, then you pick. I don't want to pick the bad stuff. I'm not good at picking bad decisions. Let's, let's use our sixth sense. No, that's not a choice. Pick one. Well, what do you get if you run to the cubicles? What's the best thing you could find? A stapler? What about the break room? Um, food. Food. Holding cells? Holding cells is where you're getting taken to, so that wouldn't make sense mm -hmm. to run to the holding cells. Or you can just run out the exit, which that's stupid, running out the exit. Uh, let's run to like the cubicles or the break room. I think cubicles because there's a lot of places to hide. Okay. Want to try that? Let's do it. All right, we run to the cubicles. You run for the cubicles to your left. Out of your peripheral vision, you see the exit door open up and two cops enter. They see you immediately run towards you while Officer Piles screams, get him, and gives chase. Running into the room, you slam the heavy wooden door. It's tiny glass window filled with chicken wire, presumably for safety. The lock clicks and you observe all three cop cops fumbling with their keys. You haven't much time. Glancing around, you see a door in the north wall past one cubicle. To the west lies a pseudo maze of cubicles. If you're going to act, do it now. 
You can lie down and let them take you, run north to the door or west to the cubicles. Cubicles. Okay, go for it. The cubicles open north towards another cubicle, east towards a middle cubicle, leading to where you were fingerprinted, and south to a lone cubicle. The cops still after you and are screaming the ubiquitous freeze. Whatever you do, you better do it quick. You can run south to the lone cubicle, east to the middle, north to the northwest, or lie down and let them take you. Pick one. Let's go north. The cubicle is plain and uncluttered. The desk is nice and tidy. The carpet is vacuumed, and there are no pictures to be seen. You can go east towards the north cubicle. That's so confusing. <laughs> or uh, return south from where you once came. Of course, you still hear the cops, and they sound very close. Um, let's go east towards, towards the north cubicle. Okay. A large wooden door sits on the north wall. A desk sits right in front of you, and the solidarity red chair sits right behind it. Um, solitary, what am I saying? Um, on the surface of the desk is a small sign which reads, register all evidence with officer on duty. Obviously, this isn't any ordinary cubicle. It's some sort of, sort of guard station, albeit empty. No wonder the cops seem like a bunch of keystones. They can't even man this desk. Whatever is behind the door must be of relative importance. I think we should run through that door. Let's do it. Silver metal shelves lining uh, lines three of the dirty concrete walls, most shelves containing a plethora of boxes and items bagged in clear plastic. Oh, it's Whoa. an evidence room. Um, an old fan, uh, old room fr- fan grumbles with its duty directly in front of you. Presumably the storage room is a shoddy replacement for an evidence hold. There are no guards and most items seem to be missing any sort of label. A square sign has been taped to the long shelves, um, but there is no sign on the third or fourth. Each sign has a block letters printed on it, black, uh, on it, in black ink. The first sign says A H, A to H. The second sign says Q to Z. You assume one shelf without a sign is I through P, but you have no idea what the fourth shelf is. It seems bare. Uh, also, you see a door on the east and south wall. You have no time to mess around, so what do you do? You can check out A through H, I through P, Q through Z. You can like look through the evidence, or you can uh, check out the fourth unlabeled shelf. You can run out the east door, south door, or let the cops get you. Why don't you check out that fourth unlabeled shelf? I mean, I know we're in a hurry, but like... That's a good idea. Yeah. This long shelf is devoid of anything. <laughs> save, a good of, save a good bit of dust. Uh, you cannot determine why the other shelves have plenty of items while this main shelf is completely bare. You, what you can determine, however, is that at least three pissed off cops are trying to catch you. You hear them approaching. All right, we can examine the rest of the storage room. Okay. Just look at one of them. A through H? Yeah, let's do it. Oh, fuck, yeah. You search the shelves and find a box cutter lying, uh, oh, lying next to a cane. And we a, a weapon master, be Lying next to a cane and a gimp suit. The only, only the box cutter looks useful as you already walk with a steady gait and you um, aren't a, into deviant sexual behavior. Well, you're not into it that much. Besides, it's a wicked-looking box cutter that appears to have an extremely, extremely sharp blade. Meanwhile, you hear the cops approaching. All right, we can keep examining. That's the only choice. It says examine the rest of the storage room. And it takes you back to this. Um, Let's go. I through P. I through P. An old suede bowler hat and pencil catch your eye on the shelf, but you don't either of those. The cops examine are the rest approaching. of the room. Q through Z. Yeah. An old pair of rollerblades catches your eye. At first you wonder what if you could skate away from the cops faster than running. Then you haven't sk- then you realize you haven't skated in years. There's a metal wrench next to the rollerblades. It's rubber yellow rubber grips and strong jaws look perfect for twisting and turning and well wrenching. You hear the cops approaching. Um we already checked out all the shelves. Now we can run to the east door or the south door. Okay. Let's go east. Oh, God. We're in the break room. Oh, fuck. Four cops are sitting in this room drinking coffee and gorging themselves full of Krispy Kreme donuts. One particularly obese cop has his right hand in his pants and voraciously scratching his genitals with a sigh of relief. Nice. Just then, however, the cops chasing you burst into the room and Officer Piles yells, You idiot, don't you hear us? Um, this bastard has been running around the station trying to escape. Officer Piles heaves with exhaustion and his face nearly purple. He grabs at his left arm. Um, the four cops stand up. Oh, yeah, so when you walked in, the, those guys didn't seem to notice you. Um, the four cops stand up, but their faces only register confusion, as though you, the message hasn't set in yet. You calmly survey the room, barely out of breath, despite your run, and consider your options. As you do so, Officer Piles collapses to the floor. Two cops notice this fact with horror and go help him. Oh, because he just, like, passed out. The other four have now encircled you. Uh, as you see it, you can either lie down and let them take you, try to fight your way out, or run like hell. This would be the most strategic place to fight, but you need a decent weapon to overcome the odds. 
And even then, you'd most likely have to kill one or more of the cops. So you can start swinging. If you have the cop's gun, click here. Okay, we don't. Dodge the cops and run through the west door. Dodge the cops and run through the south door. Lie down and let them take you. But we have the box cutter. Yeah, but that's not a choice. That says dodge the cops and run is probably our best option. Because start, start swinging says start swinging question mark. <laughs> oh, it does have a question mark. Damn, we didn't get any of the cops' guns. How could we have done that? I don't know. You better start running, boy. All right, let's go through this, the west door. Oh, we're back in the storage oh my room. Yeah, we're back in the storage room. So let's go through the south door. Okay. A large wooden door sits to the north wall. A desk sits right in front of you with a... Oh, this is the same... How do we get out? Oh, my God. I'm stuck. Run through the north door. Back in the storage room. South door. It's a maze, boy. You got to figure it out. Northwest cubicle. The cubicle is plain and uncluttered. Oh, fuck. Run through the west cubicle. Keep going. Oh, my God, dude. I'm at the middle cubicle. Dude, I'm like getting... I keep looping around through these three cubicles. Uh, North... Oh, we got caught. The cops catch up to you when you run to the north cubicle. Here you are running from the cops chasing you, and you mess around and take too long. The cops burst from every direction and roughly tackle you. Damn it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you get taken to holding. The holding cells. This is, this is hard, man. Um, the cop unlocks the steel door right in front of you and opens it on creaking hinges you were brought into a long hallway lined on either side by holding cells uh, groups of prisoners lounge in most of them most of them staring at you through the bars without surprise an enormous crow magnet skinhead emits a deep laugh as you're dragged by uh, his hand reaches through the bars his bicep easily doubling the diameter of your head his shoulders plastered with a black swastika and ropey muscles of his forearm tattooed with the words lang lebend de fuhrer uh, the black ink blurs as you cool. pass so he's just a Nazi in jail. Sick. Um, and the cops beat <clears throat> at his hand with their nightstick, causing him to withdraw it so you have no time to decipher its meaning. Uh, the hallway is a dead end at an impenetrable concrete wall. They open your cell to the right, throw you in, and lock the door behind you. Okay, you can look around your cell. Oh, my God, how long is this? This is crazy. Um, I have no idea. I don't even... You asked me if I wanted to play a game called Mommy, Can I Go Out and Kill Tonight? I know. It's crazy. You look around warily. The cell is a uh, square plane concrete with no windows. The bench lines two of the walls, and the far one is a stopped-up urinal overflowing. There are no windows, given the space, a drab, colorless, depressing air. Um, you occupy the cell. The first is Two people. Two occupy. people. I'm sorry. I'm, like, reading a lot. This is getting, like... The first is an elderly black man sitting on the bench with his eyes closed. The other is a skinny Hispanic standing right to the right by the urinal, urinal, arms folded across his shirtless chest, glaring at you. The way he's staring at you is a bit alarming. You can talk to the black man. You can sit down by yourself, talk to the Hispanic man, or examine the urinal. <clears throat> Let's talk to the black man. You walk up and say hello. His eyes remain closed. He doesn't respond. Get the fuck away from him. You hear the Hispanic say, you repeat yourself. Still, the man doesn't show any sign he's heard you. I said, get the fuck away from him. The Hispanic man takes a menacing step towards you. Suddenly recall that you are wearing a very expensive suit, albeit rumpled and dirty after your ordeal. All your training dictates that you walk away or try to calm him. Calming him seems unlikely. unlikely. What seems likely is that you're about to get punched in the nose for your suit. Maybe you're being too docile, showing weakness by minding your own business. Maybe you should get verbally abusive in turn. Maybe you should even add an ethnic slur. Oh, God. Mm -mm. Um, no. Walk away and sit down by yourself or tell him, piss off, blank, before I got you. Sit down. Well, we have to establish some sort sit of dominance. Sit down. Okay, we sit down. Better not cause trouble. Sit down and wait for the cops to give you your phone call. You post bail and get the hell out of there. There's no clock anywhere within view, but you realize it must be later than 10. Excuses start flooding your mind, ways to explain your lateness. Your thoughts are really interrupted by an... Um, what is it? How do you say that? I don't know. Uh, by a voice. You, um, what? You're too good for me? You look up and see the Hispanic standing over you. Nice suit, Holmes. 
He, he looks at you meaningfully. All your training dictates that you walk away. Oh, it's the same thing. Um, tell him, piss off, or ignore him and hope he goes away. Ignore him. I'm not saying that word. You pay no attention. You look at the floor, avoiding eye contact, hoping he'll go away, leave you to your misery and excuses. Hey, you. He shoves your shoulder. You still ignore him. You know who I am? He leans in and he screams your ear. You deaf, motherfucker? Seconds later, you're lifted to a standing position and you're not a small guy. He pushes you down on the cold floor cell, standing up. Uh, standing up, you brush your suit off and try to sit back down, all the while maintaining an air of indifference. That's when he comes for you. Your beating awaits. That's our only choice, is our beating awaits. <coughs> Do you want to read this one? Yeah. He backhands you across the face, much like the cops did. The slap stings just as much. A millisecond later, he punches you square in the eye, knocking you to the ground. Your face smashes into the hard concrete of the floor, knocking, a lo- knocking loose a filling. <laughs> Engraged, your, your turn. But he's already on you, punching you once, twice, three times in the face. The Hispanic grabs you by the throat with both hands. Beating at his hands does no good. This bastard is much stronger than he looked. You struggle and gasp for breath. Leave that boy alone, CJ. The soft voice comes from your left, but you can barely hear it. You can't breathe. You feel yourself losing consciousness. Leave him alone, I said. The hands relax their grip. You grasp for air like a fish flopping uselessly on land. As your vision clears, you see the voice come from the back. Oh, sorry. You see the voice came from the black man. CJ is standing over you, fists clenched. But a moment later, he backs away. Our only choice says, lucky you. Saved from certain death. You slowly get up from the hard concrete floor and rub your neck, still breathing heavily. The black man looks up and says, you smart but timid boy. Minding your business don't get you killed as fast, but CJ wasn't going to let you be. He stands up and you regard him with ambivalence. His face looks vaguely familiar, but you have no idea where you would have seen him. His hair is a wild fray, his clothes dirty. His stink reaches you from here and you wonder how you didn't smell it before. With one hand, he scratches his stubble chin. The hand is scarred beyond belief. Thick, pinkish lines stacked on top of normal tissue make it look like a malformed club. You know me, he asks. You remember now. Who could forget that hand? Yes, you say. You were in the hospital because you wanted to kill yourself. Right, boy, that's right. He slaps his thigh with the meat hand and moves closer to you. No insurance, remember? I remember. And you knew I was about to kill my motherfucking self, right? You consider, thinking back. I knew, yes. But you let me stay anyway. That week was hot, maybe 105 degrees for three days in a row, and shelters were often full. I did. CJ cracks his knuckles to your right. You notice he's standing almost behind you. And you didn't get shit for that. His breath is fetid like old sardines. I didn't get paid, if that's what you mean. The man looks satisfied. He smiles and sits back down. With a look from him, CJ moves away from you and sits on the opposite bench. Didn't think so, the black man says thoughtfully. Name's Lamonte. Sit down. I want to talk to you. Doesn't look like you have a choice. Our only choice is doesn't look like you have a choice. You sit down next to him as he requested. He just stares at you with a smile on his face. Minutes pass. You hear the skinhead from down the block yelling something incomprehensible. Gave you a break because you gave me one. What's your name? Dominic, you reply. Ooh, our name's Dominic. Ooh, fun. Good name is any, he says. What you doing here, looking like you do? You explain the circumstances leading up to your arrest, and he laughs. CJ snorts. Nice moves, boy. Sounds like you ain't as smart as you look. You let the comment go. He's probably right. Show me what you got in your pockets. You show him everything you have. Besides those things, you got anything else? Our only choice says nope, nope nothing, nothing else. else. Glad you was straight with me, Dominic. He looks over at CJ. We don't tolerate no lying motherfuckers up in here. You straighten your suit jacket and wait for him to speak again. Lamonte leans over and whispers, I got a proposition for you. Ignoring the sinking feeling that this is some sort of filthy godfather about to make you an offer you can't refuse, especially in a confined space, you reply, I'm listening. I'm going to read this one. Okay. Okay, listen here. First off, you ain't going to get a phone call, so you ain't getting out of here tonight. He coughs. I don't know what that word is. Um, then continues. Uh, <laughs> Payphone's broken. It's Friday. They'll hold your ass till Monday. You don't get bailed out. 
His information sets in. Two more days in the cell, Stacey will get really worried and you will get fired for being a no-show. Miranda writes violated because the pay phone's broken. Not possible. Not possible. You consider pounding on the bars to get a cop's attention. Um, I know what you're thinking. They don't care. They'll say, they'll say you smashed up some phone or some shit. Smashed up the phone or some shit. I'm, but I'm in with one of them. Owes me a favor. He'll let you use the station phone. You got someone to call? Yeah, my girlfriend. You mumble. Lamonte smiles. You know she'll answer? I think so, yeah. Okay, good. That's real good. Now, here's the proposition. I get the cop to let you use the working phone. You call your woman. He watches your eyes, right? You could get out of here tonight. I only want one thing in return. What's that? You hold your breath certain he's going to demand you pay CJ's bail or for an attorney to let him stay or to let him stay with you. When I get out, I want you to call this number. He passes you a tiny slip of white paper, scrawled in pencil, are the numbers 314-594-2196. Isaac will answer. Tell him LA's got taken down in Richmond Heights. Finish the deal, then hang up. Think you can do that, white boy? If you have access to a phone, why can't you just call the number? You Riley ask. Because those motherfucking cops be listening. I can't have that. Gotta be done on the outside. Now you're going to do it or not. You make the mental note of the phone number and the name. Consult your character sheet if you need to remember. So you say, okay, I'll do it. Or you say, no, I'm getting, and keep trying to get the cop's attention. I say we do it. Let's do it. Seems like the best option now. Okay. You evaluate his posture, expression, and eyes, and you don't sense any dishonesty. You're quite a good judge. Besides the way the cops have treated you in the past couple hours led you to believe that you may never get out of this cell. Lamonte's proposition might be your only way out. I'll do it. Get me a phone. All right. Just remember, you fuck me out on this one, I'll fine you. You don't doubt he would, or at least his friends would. Neither would be good. Lamonte cashes in a favor. Walking up to the bars, Lamonte calls out, Yo, St- uh, Stein, you half expect the skinhead to yell out mockingly, but he doesn't. Instead, you hear heavy footsteps of a cop. Officer Stein walks up to the bars, glances at you, back at Lamonte. What do you want, Lamonte? I want my friend here pointing at you to make his phone call. Officer Piles won't like it. I don't give a fuck what Piles likes, man. Give this man his phone call. Reluctantly, Officer Stein nods his head. You wonder what Lamonte did for him because that that would cause this obedience. Opening the cell door, the cop points you in the direction of the phone, falls right behind you. You hear him whisper, you tell me what you're doing for Lamonte and I'll tear up that ticket. Oh, let you out right now. Ho, ho, ho. What do, you, what do you say? Glancing to your right, you see the skinhead sullenly look at you, eyes like tiny black coals. Lamonte couldn't hear from where he was. Okay, so basically... The cop is offering to free you right now. I ain't no snitch. If you snitch. Snitches get stitches. I don't think we snitch. No snitching. Okay, so our offer is refuse and let him lead you to the phone or tell Officer Stein what he wants to know. Bitch, we going to the phone. Refuse. The phone is sitting at a desk where you're fingerprinted. Officer Stein points to it and says, two minutes. Then he crosses his arms and stares at you expectantly. You pick up the phone, quickly dial home. The phone rings once, twice, three times. Answer, baby. Answer, please. You mutter on the fifth ring. She answers, hello, Stacy, it's me. Oh, hi, Peachy, how's work? You hear her close the refrigerator door. Actually, baby, I'm not at work. I got arrested. Arrested? What the hell happened? I don't have time to explain. This is my only phone call. I barely got even got to make it. I need you to come to the Richmond Heights station and bail me out. It's right off 40 off on Bellevue. Okay, I'll be right up. See you soon. She hangs up. So intelligent, this one. Great sense of humor, but knows when to get serious and how to get things done. A strong woman, and you're lucky to be with her. Great sense of direction, too, unlike you, who gets lost five minutes from your house. You have no doubt she'll be there to bail you within the next 15 minutes. Stein leads you back to yourself. That's our only option. Stein says, all right, you got your phone call. You sure you don't want to tell me what you're doing for Lamonte? You shrug and wisely remain silent. Wisely. 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 He leads you back to your cell, opens it, slams the door shut behind you, hopes Stacy has $1,500. That's your bail. Angry, he walks away. Once the cop is gone, Lamonte grabs him. How to go, boy. Grabs your arm. How to go, boy. While Stacy's on her way, you sit back down on the bench. Lamonte sits next to you, and CJ's still standing at the urinal. With a peculiar with a peculiar gleam in his eye, Lamonte says, Stein tried to shake you down. You nod. Thought so. And you didn't say shit. Good man. You made the right decision, Dominic. Don't forget to make that phone call. Hell yeah. I won't. Stacy arrives. Is our only option. Less than 10 minutes later, two cops you don't recognize approach one uh, the cell. One opens up the door. The other stands to the side, hands on his gun. Saint, you made bail. Out. Monte looks into your eyes, his bloodshot, um, and a matter of factly, I held up my end. Boy, don't fuck with me. You leave the cell, you walk away, you glance over your shoulder and see Lamonte clenching the bars watching you. You go meet up with Stacy. You step outside, and it's beginning to get dark. Thanks for coming so fast. That was the worst. You give her a long kiss on the mouth. No problem. Mm. Now tell me what the hell happened. Oh. Both of you walk towards the car. It's been released from lockup, and it's parked on the side of the station. 
telling her everything, everything, leaving out no detail. She registers only shock. Is all that true, or are you exaggerating like you usually do? You sigh. Unfortunately, I'm not exaggerating. Jesus, babe, both you in the past couple hours, uh, both of you allow the past couple hours to set in, she says. So now what? You're going to call that number? What time is it? Five o'clock, she states. I don't think you should call it. I don't. Uh, they don't know who you are. You think about this statement for a while. Actually, I told that guy my first name, and when the cops let me out, they said my last name. She looks at you for a while, her mouth slightly open, and then says, oh, no. Uh, in, in the... Li- in the uh, it'd be a comical, ex- it'd be comical except for your situation. I know. Look what God did. You scratch your head. Okay. So you can make the call and forget it. You can make the call and go home. Okay. So you make the call, go to the hospital, forget the call, go to the hospital, make the call, go home, forget the call, go home. I say we make the call and then go to work. Yeah, let's do that. <clears throat> I'm going to make the call, then I have to get to the hospital, you say. All right, good luck, baby. Call me later. Tell me what happened. She kisses you and leaves you at your car. You get in your car, drive out of the station, head back to the highway. There's a phone by the hospital you can use. Ten minutes later, you arrive at the hospital, parking in your spot. You get out and walk directly to the payphone, remembering the number. You dial it. After two rings, you hear a male voice answer. Yeah. L.A. got taken down in Richmond Heights. Finish the deal. You state more meekly than you meant to. The voice doesn't respond. The phone hangs up dead. You hang up. Well, that went well, you think. Going into the hospital, you step into an elevator and take it to the fourth floor, considering various, various excuses along the way. There's no, uh, there's one option. It just says inside. The elevator doors open up and you stand in a small ant, ant room. Ante room, I don't know how to say that. A locked door on either side of the behavioral medicine inpatient unit. The walls have been freshly painted, painted dark green and a sport a high, uh, foot high strip of pattern wallpaper to the top. Hospital executives thought a quick makeover of the lobby would otherwise co- cover up the disgusting state, state of the unit and Im- improve visitor relations. Getting your master key, you ignore the buzzer and adjoining sign which reads push button and state your business. Unlock the east door and you enter the unit. You enter the psych ward. <clears throat> the inside of the unit is very uh, different from the touched up ant room. Um, everything is a drab gray and the drywall is cracked in places. Um, most of the unit is geriatric patients in wheelchairs. Many of them are total care. That, uh, the fact means, this fact means they shit and piss themselves and can't move, much less walk. And due to dementia, they often try to stand up. This place is hell. Coincidentally, it's shaped like a big H. 15 plus old demented people try to stand up, ripping out their catheters, feeding tubes, falling and smashing, um, on their faces on the floor with six total staff on a good day and only three covering the area you're now looking at. It's ridiculous for the clinical director to expect safety. A couple of years ago, you worked here as an RN, and these factors were the major reason you so quickly got your master's degree. No longer would you be one of those floor nurses struggling to keep their licenses and health of their backs from all the lifting. Now you talk to the patients, write orders and leave. No more lifting, no more cleaning feces, um, no more eight hours of patients yelling into your face. Woo, nearly the, you nearly scream with joy every time you enter the unit. Okay, you can go up to the nursing station or enter the bathroom. Hold on. There's a map, and it's shaped like an H. <clears throat> yeah, this is the unit. Above and below the center of the H, it says elevators. The red dot is where you enter. Patient room, and then there's patient rooms on both sides of the H, mm-hmm. and the middle says nursing station. We're up at the top right. And it says legend. The red dot is where you entered the unit. The black box is the staff bathroom. So those are the two places we could go. They're right next to us. Hmm. I don't know. Nursing station? Yeah. You walk up to the nursing, nursing station. Um, Devin, the unit security, sees you immediately. Secretary. Sorry. That's good. Um, sees you immediately and says, hi, Dr. Saint. I don't have my PhD yet. And even if I did, I, I know you don't want me to... I know I, you know I want you to call me Dominic. You respond affectionately. Devin is your first name. Only several hard workers in the unit, and you have a positive professional relationship. She refuses to call you by your first name, citing respect as their reason. I've got your roster here. Your roster is a list, list of patients that you need to see and possibly write orders on. Devin hasn't mentioned anything yet about you being late, and no doctors are in sight. Dr. Gullah Brown yet? You casually ask. Devin winks at you uh, conspiratorially. Nope. No one knows you were late, Dr. Saint. She glances at the wall clock. Damn, you are late. Everything okay? Her sense of genuine concern. 
You sense her genuine concern. Uh, yes, Devin, everything's okay. Had a little car trouble. Okay, well, here's your roster. She starts to walk away, or you start to walk away, and she calls after you. Dr. Saint, your cell phone. You left it here yesterday afternoon. So that's where that thing was. Ooh. Thank you. I was wondering where I'd, where I'd left that. Not being a physician has its privileges. You don't have to be on call. So it's not a strange, not strange you forget your phone. Nonetheless, you're glad to have it back. So you can take the cell phone. So now in our inventory, we have our character sheet, a speeding ticket, and a cell phone, beach. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Looking at your roster, how you doing? Good. Looking at your roster, you have three patients to see today. Dr. Zayla... Must have discharged the other two. First, there's Julia, 37-year-old female with bipolar disorder. She was admitted after she tried to overto- overdose on 15 Tylenol, but then decided she didn't want to die and went to the emergency department. She's very depressed and cries frequently. Since her admission, she's gained 15 pounds. Next, there's Antonio, 25-year-old male with antisocial personality disorder. He was admitted when he went to the emergency department and stated he would kill himself. He has a history of crack cocaine abuse, is homeless, and very manipulative. Uh, and drug seeking. Despite his charming demeanor, he is prone to outbursts and physical violence. Most likely, Antonio lied about wanting to kill himself to get free room and board. This statement is not pious. It's commonly called m- malingering in the psych profession. Finally, there's April, a 51 year old female with psychosis not otherwise specified as NOS. She was admitted after a cop saw her in the middle of a busy street holding up a Bible over her head, yelling passages from Revelations. April is hyper religious and bizarre and often places the hall. Uh, reading script, uh, paces the hall reading scripture out loud and then laps into absolute silence for hours. Okay, you can talk to Julie, Antonio, April, um, and then you're finished with your rest. Well, so we're probably going to end up talking to all of them, yeah. so just start. All right, we talked to Julie. <clears throat> you find Julie in her room. She's sitting in her bed weeping. You knock on the front door and say hello. She slowly looks up, blotting the tears from her eyes. Are you he- here to see me, she asked Oli. I sure am. Let's go into the group room and talk. You realize it'll be therapeutic to get her out of this room where she has no doubt um, sequestered herself. You unlock the, the group room door and let Julian. Antonia comes striding in and you to you and stands inappropriately close. What's up, Doc? You going to write me some Percocet? My back's really hurt me. He says affably, smiling, co- smiling confidently. I'm with another patient, Antonio. He smiles. His smile fades ever so s- subtly. But you're going to write me that Percocet. His eyes bore on to you. He moves a step closer. You're in my space again. We talked about this last time, remember? I'll speak with you later. Antonio backs up, starts smiling again. One fist is clenched. You wait till he moves safely away before you turn your back and enter the group room. Don't forget about that Percocet. You hear him call from the hallway. You sit down with Julie. You can hear what she has to say. Mm -hmm. Sitting down, you say, things don't look like they're going so well. Julie sniffles and replies, no. You wait, but she doesn't elaborate. Two months ago, at your office, Julie was bouncing off the walls, smiling, joking, laughing. Her current depression is more part of her bipolar disorder than any understandable stimulus, such as getting divorced or losing one's job. I'm getting fat, she finally continues. Look at me. I've gained like 20 pounds. You're currently treating her with several drugs, most notably Xanax and Depakote. Addressing these factors, you reply, we don't want to change anything at this crucial point, or... Let's rethink your medicines, or I'll think about my concerns and get back to you. I'll think and get back to okay. you, for sure. Yeah. All right, you can go back to your rounds. Wait. Julie, I, Julie, I understand your concerns, but I'm not sure we're going to what we're going to do about them. Let me think about it and get back to you. She sniffles, nods, and gets up to leave. I'll see you tomorrow. Now we can talk with Antonio. Okay. It's not too hard to find Antonio. He's been following you around ever since you arrived on the unit. He's hovering <laughs> over you, dressed and dirty. He just wants Percocet. Oh, poor Antonio. He has his fist clenched. Um, as you approach the day room, he stands up from the card game he was playing and strides towards you. Sup, Doc? My turn? Everyone insists on calling you Doc or Doctor because you write prescriptions and you were tired of correcting them. Your turn. Let's go to the staff lounge to talk. It looks exactly like the day room with glass doors, sink tables, and chairs, but it's in plain sight of the nursing station. Staff lounge, I thought you'd take everybody to the group room, he, he questions. You don't fear being alone with this little punk in the group room, but such an action would be unwise considering his violent tendencies. Motioning him to the staff lounge, you ignore the comment. See what Antonio has to say. Okay. Sitting down with Antonio, you consult your notes. This patient has been here for three days. And you don't have him on any medications. Despite having stated to an emergency department nurse that he would kill himself, he evidences 
no signs or symptoms of depression. Rather, he has a normal he has normal sleeping patterns, play cards all day, orders extra food on his tray, and wanders the unit. Though his uh, though he's staff demanding um, some doctors fix fix his ingrown toenail and give him pain medicine for it. <laughs> Antonio stares at you expectantly. So Antonio, <laughs> you feeling suicidal? Oh yeah, I want to kill myself. What sort of things make you want to kill yourself? Shit, doc, everything. I just want to kill myself. Antonio looks annoyed and leans towards you across the table. Have you formulated a plan to kill yourself? Plan? What do you mean, plan? He looks confused. How would you kill yourself? Ignoring your question entirely, he says, you're the best doc here. I'm starting to feel better, but I need to look at my toe. I need some pain medicine. He tears off his shoe and puts his dirty foot on the table. His great toe's nail obviously ingrown. It's brown and crusty. Mm -mm. Gross. This isn't a medical unit, Antonio. You're here because you're a danger to yourself, as you told me, Antonio. Antonio, seeing that his polite words are, are getting him nowhere, he narrows his eyes. Motherfucker, I need some goddamn pain meds. This thing hurts. All right, I'll write you some Tylenol extra strength or I can transfer you to medical. You start to get up. Your assessment finished. Percocet, doc. I need Percocet. Tylenol ain't going to do shit. He screams. He nearly screams. Holding his gaze, you say evenly, you won't be getting any Percocet here, Antonio. He stares back with obvious rage, gets up, slams the table with his palms, leaves the room. You shake your head and consider discharging him, jotting down a few notes and get back to your rounds. He drops something on the floor or you go back to your rounds. Ooh, he drops something on the floor. Whoa. In his anger, something dropped from Antonio's Whoa. pocket. Examining it more carefully, you see it's a sealed condom. You certainly can't just leave it lying on the floor. You pick it up, either throw it away or keep it. Pick Maybe it, it will prove of some use to you. We picked up a condom, y'all. Oh. Oh, my God, dude. What the heck? All right, let's go talk to April. Let's talk to April. April's pacing up and down the hall, Bible in her hand. Um, her head hangs low. Her brown curls of sweeping hair, of her hair sweeping her shoulder with each step. She's very tall for her sex, but not absurdly so, like the volleyball player you once had in the ward. Approaching her, you say her name once. April. She pauses in her med meditation and looks up. No re recognition apparent in her eyes. It's Dominic. She continues to look at you, her eyes dull and mouth slack, as though she's sedated. Walking back to the nurse station, she, you ask a nurse how April's been today. She was screaming for hours before you got here, running up and down the halls. We gave her some Ativan IMs, so April sedated for a necessary factor, obviously. That's why you prescribed it to her to, to be used as needed. You walk up to April, who is still standing over there watching you. April, let's go to the group room and talk. Okay, she responds. Uh, April stands next to the chair, obviously unwilling to sit down. You sit, hoping she will follow your lead. How are you, April? About 30 seconds later, she says, fine. She sits down. Are you hearing voices? She says, yes, I hear God's voice. She grips her Bible firmly in her hand. What does this voice tell you? He tells me that you're all sinners, all of you. The devil works in ways we cannot imagine. April thrusts the Bible at you in accusation. How's your husband? You shift the subject, knowing that this woman was a reliable first grade teacher only two weeks ago. Apparently, paying no attention, she raises her voice and yells, Sinners, all of you. April then begins to silent pray, <laughs> silently Shit. pray, although her thin lips move with each word. She then lapses into a stuporous state and ignores you. You're not going to get anything out of her at this point. The blood tests are fine, no drug or alcohol abuse, no psychological trauma you can determine from speaking with the husband. The best thing is to hope that she snaps out of whatever psychosis she's in. Out of in, in tow, whenever she becomes restless or agitated than she is now. Thank you, April. I'll see you tomorrow. She stands up without answering and leaves the room. You jot down notes and continue with your rounds. You're finished with your rounds. Finish speaking to all three patients. You head back to the nursing station and write your orders. Intuition tells you something bad is about to happen, but you only have uh -oh. a millisecond to react. Do you react in time is the only option. Our only choice. Click it. Too slow to react. No, damn it. A fist hits you from the side. Your jaw is oh, crushed sideways from the blow. And you were knocked a foot to your side, shaking oh. it off. You quickly turn and observe your attacker. Antonio has blindsided oh, you and is laughing. Oh, shit. He motherfucker. sucker punched us. He said, motherfucker, you ain't even a doctor. He swings <sighs> another right towards your face. Nurses are rushing at him from all sides, but you would instantly realize that if you don't take action now, this punch will definitely connect, possibly doing serious damage. You have lost five endurance points. Damn. Allow the punch to connect. Try to dodge the punch or retaliate. It says retaliate. After all, it is in legal defense of your person. I say try to dodge it. I don't think you should punch a patient. We dodge the punch. Rather than let his punch connect or retaliate, you instinctively dodge. You fluidly move to the side and his punch misses. Antonio falls forward with his missed blow, but you step away from 
uh, step away instead of striking him in the throat like you badly want to. A second later, nurses tackle Antonio from all sides and pin him down. You calmly order um, Haldol 10 milligram IM stat, probably a sedation, when while Antonio rides and squirms about the floor, screaming curse words laced with ra- racial epithets. Uh, Evan goes to the med room and prepares the drug. While you, you, while you yearn to retaliate, you, you silently praise yourself for remaining calm and handling the situation as an adult. Yes, you're 32, but it's difficult to think of yourself as, as an adult when you're still so filled with vices and violent temperament. Oh, sorry. Minutes later, Evan swabs Antonio's arm, uh. then injects the Haldol into his left shoulder. Uh. Still cursing and trying to kick you, he's dragged towards seclusion. Uh. Dusting off your jacket, you proceed to your orders. All in a day's work, Beach. You're not even a doctor. <laughs> you finish writing your orders. Um, from their charts, doing what you told your patients you would. Think of Antonio. From your assessment, you decide if he's malingering or and not suicidal, suicidal at all. However, due to federal law, if you were to discharge him and he were to kill himself, you could be held liable. Hopefully, he'll become angry when he doesn't get any Percocet or medical attention for his toe and demand to leave against medical advice, AMA. Um, then you'd be free and clear. You'd have to speak with Dr. Zayla about this, but be sure you'll, but you're sure she'll trust your judgment. Finish with your duties for the day. You take a look at the clock. It's nearly five o'clock. Damn, it's late. Usually you finish a little time, uh, a little afternoon. This, but today has been a unique experience, to put it mildly. The sun is very low in the sky, and the shadows of twilight are upon you. You go outside the hospital. Once you are safely out of view of the hospital's entrance, you light a cigarette to take a long drag. You unlock your car, get in. And consider your options. Drive back to your apartment. That's all. It's getting dark outside, and your house is illuminated by an orange glow. Your day's adventures well together in your head, squirming like the lost rodents in a saddest maze. Uh, paranoia grips you because of your last encounter with the cops. At least it didn't end with you murdering the pigs. Not that the thought didn't cross your mind, but that, <clears throat> but that was not a past you wanted to revisit. You're thankful you managed to avoid... Your, uh, your natural urge to kill the worthless crackhead that was Antonio, crushing his trachea, would have removed one, one more of flesh from one more waste of flesh from the world, but certainly Jeez. destroyed your career. You randomly wonder, wonder how Lamonte is doing it if he remembers that you didn't rat. At least you called his contact, one less person to worry about having it out for you. You go to unlock your door to your apartment, but curiously, it's not only is it unlocked, but it's slightly ajar. The door is ajar. Oh my God. You cautiously enter. You feel a sense of foreboding. Everything looks the way you left it, but a gnawing sensation tells your brain, in your brain tells you to be careful. Straining your ears is futile. You hear nothing. No one is in the family room. Alert, you creep room to room, but nothing, but no ap- appears to be within. Um, however, your door to your office is closed. You don't remember closing it. You throw open the door. Stubborn as a mule born with neurologic defect, you throw open the door, howling like a bloodthirsty pirate expecting the worst. It takes a minute to register what you see. Leon, your friend from New York City, is sitting at your computer typing away. He seems unconcerned at you hurling open the door and screaming like a maniac. Your mouth hangs open as you process the information. How? You stammer. Hey, dude, don't look so surprised, he says calmly. The cigarette he's holding in his right hand has smoldered down to a really long ash. Notice this. Noticing this, he stubs it out. I left you like a million messages. I didn't know you were coming, you begin. And when the hell did you get here, you ask. And was Stacy here, you continue, hopefully. And how the fuck did you get in my apartment, you finish. Relax, man. Like I said, I told you to call me back and you didn't. So here I am. No, I didn't see your girl. Bemused, you grin. Holy shit. You should see the day I've been having. I almost killed your ass. Killed me, Leon chuckles. I heard you coming since you opened the door, man. Don't forget who I am and what we did together. He arches his eyebrow accusingly, but you make no, but you sense no malice. This is one of your best friends after all. And yes, he helped you out in a really tight spot but and never asked anything in return. You smile broadly. Well, it's good to see you, though I don't know why you're here. In a minute, uh, anything strange go down the lobby? He says, in a minute, anything strange go down the lobby? You tell Leon everything. Well, what the, who's that guy? I don't know. You and Leon sit down on your couch and you recount the day, details of your day. Um, leaving out nothing. During the story, his expression barely changes, though he laughs with points. at points. Um, at the end, he, he lights up another cigarette, thinking, despite self, being self-sufficient, you w- welcome any advice he might give you. Finally, he looks down at you and says, you stupid fuck, we got a lot to talk about. Oh, yeah, 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 I found your uh, note on the door from your girl. Said you left your cell at the hospital. That, um, that was helpful. 
you think. He assesses your reaction and says, fine, you want some Confucius-like advice? Considering your past choices, he tells you. Least you fucked with the cops. We got a lot to talk about. You ready? You head, uh, you think over what ne uh, Leon has said. What do we have to talk about? What's going on? He suddenly looks dead serious. We'll talk about it, but not here. Any good bars in the tornado pit of town? The Loop has some decent ones, you answer. Which ones? You explain the best bars, Cicero's, and you give him directions. You head for the Loop. The Loop, home of various bars and grills, as well as fine restaurants. A tattoo parlor and three shops uh, line Del Mar, the main thoroughfare. You pull into a parking lot in front of Cicero's and a pizza, a pizza joint and beer joint. As you step out of the car, a man with a white grizzled beard and tattered, uh, dirty clothes approaches you. He holds out his hand, smiles, missing two of his otherwise darkly stained teeth. Alm, sir? Anything for an old vet? Don't give him anything is your only option. Patting your pockets, you say, sorry, I don't have anything for you. You move on and head inside Cicero's. <clears throat> It's crowded in here. The beautiful decor and upper middle class atmosphere um, in the front is offset by the speedy by the seedy pool table and jukebox to your left. At the far rear of your restaurant, where a filthy carpet replaces the white tie with its tasteful black squares. Waitress is carrying bottles of food, weave in and out of the customer sitting at tables in white cloth, some laughing, some getting ready to order. Um, various plants hang from the ceiling. Hey Jude is playing softly in the background. Hey Jude. Don't make it bad. Make a sad song and make it better. Only two tables are open, a booth in the very back near the pool table and some bikers and a table right in front of you. You take the table to the left or the back. Which one? Left. Yeah. <clears throat> you want to read this one? Yeah. <coughs> you sit at the table to your left. Leon walks over from the bar where he was waiting for you and sits down. Almost immediately, a waitress approaches and takes your drink orders. Needing to drink, needing to keep your mind sharp, both of you order a Coke instead of alcohol. The waitress walks off and Leon leans toward you. Dom, we've been friends for a long time. I helped you in the past and never asked for anything in return. Now, I need your help. He stares at you, measuring your reaction. You've rarely seen him so serious. Of course, man, but your voicemail sounded pretty bad. Just tell me what's going on. Okay, listen. You know my ties with the Russian mob, which is how I helped you get rid of those. He looked around to make sure no one was listening. Corpses. There's a guy named Serge. I'm not connected that well, or I'd have no problem. Luckily, either is he. The uh, difficulty is that the mob won't take sides. It's not worth their time. They'll let us fight it out and deal with the result. Leon lights a cigarette and blows a ring of smoke into the air. Stop dissembling. What sort of problem are you having with this guy, you ask? Leon leans even closer. The problem, fucko, is that we, we both deal in things that fell off trucks. Leon makes little quotation marks with his fingers, and you almost laugh. Obviously stolen merchandise. We have to cut the mob a percentage, of course, to work in their neighborhood. Serge is getting pretty big for his fucking britches, and hit one of my shipments, killed one of my guys, took the stuff. If I don't take care of him, I'm dead. You pause, taking in everything he said. I see the problem, man, but don't you have people to take care of this? Leon blows out another cloud of smoke. Yeah, dickbag, I have people, but I think Serge is buying them off. I don't trust those fuckers. They'd kill their own members for enough money, and right now Serge has more money than me. I've got Ray, and I've got you. Only ones I trust. Only ones who wouldn't turn me in for money. Old school, fucko. Old school. He coughs and looks around and yells, Where's my fucking Coke? <laughs> so what role would I play? The waitress comes up, glares at Leon, and puts both Cokes down, then walks away without bothering to take your food order. Neither of you has looked up at the menu anyway. You, me, Ray, we arm ourselves and bust into Serge's shithole of an apartment and kill them all. How many? Five, six, less than ten. Five, six, less than ten? How about twenty? How many, Leon? Listen, man, yeah, 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 there's more, but there won't be there. And besides, we kill Serge, and they just get mer mercenaries for hire. Not my problem. We hit them at night without too many guys, and we'll be fine. You owe me, Dom. You fucking owe me. Will you help me or not? Our choices are, of course I'll help you, or I can't. I'm out of that life now, and I'm not going back. I say fuck it. And do it? Yeah. All right. Because he helped us, and he could always expose us bad. He did. Loyalty. All right, I'll do it. 
You've agreed to help Leon out of loyalty. You don't need to be told again how much he helped you, how much your new life depended on his aid getting rid of those bodies. Telling him you're out of that life would be a slap in his face. You just hope he doesn't knock you into oblivion of psychosis. Time will tell. That's what I'm talking about, fucko. He looks around. Let's get the hell out of here. I've got plane tickets. Not even bothering to order, you throw down some money for the sodas and go with Leon. Our only choice says go to the airport. The upper level of Lambert is barren. It's late enough that no one is waiting in line to check bags or buy tickets. As you walk towards the escalators, Leon produces two first-class one-way tickets. He laughs at your expression. What? I knew you'd come with me, and I don't fly coach. I'll get you another ticket when we finish with Surge. Business must be going well, damn, you answer. It will be a lot better once we, get t- take, once we take Surge out, but yeah, yeah, it's going well. Our flight's at 9 p.m., gate 23. Let's go. Together, you walk towards security and stand in line. It's currently 7.45 p.m. With the advent of terrorism, people are taking shoes off and throwing away bottles of lotion. Hopefully you don't have anything that will call notice to your presence. When your turn comes, you walk through the metal detector. Our only choice says, nothing beeps, and you proceed through security. (laughs) Finally through security, you and Leon head to gate 23. It's now 8.20 p.m. The drab gray carpet does nothing to improve your increasingly poor mood. Worried, you feel your hands start to tremble. A pale sheen of sweat covers your forehead and you wipe it away with the back of your hand. When you arrive at the gate, they're already boarding the plane. Leon says, Ah, yeah, that's lucky, he glances over at you. You all right, fucko? You look kind of pale. Smiling weakly, you reply, Sure, I just don't like to fly. Well, I didn't used to like to fly. Thought I got over that. I need to sit down a minute. We can't sit down. They're boarding. No way we're missing this flight. Come on, let's go. Our only choice says, He's right. You need to board the plane now. You feel almost unable to continue. Irrational fear grips your mind. Notions me. <laughs> Notions of malfunctioning. Anxious on the plane. Me, <laughs> beach. Notions of malfunctioning engines and 50 ton stones dropping 30,000 feet. Passengers screaming at the long descent before the final rest. Two minutes of absolute horror. Dom, fuck, man. I've been calling your name for like a minute. Snap out of it. Have a drink or something. Our only choice says take your seat. You want me to jump in for a few? Um, You and Leon sink into the blush leather seats and breathe a sigh of relief. The captain announces that the skies are clear and you'll be taking off without a delay. A flight attendant immediately approaches with a plastic smile and offers you both a cocktail. I'll take a gin and tonic, Leon says. Your orders are order scotch rocks or pull out your Wink bottle that you had ordered through Wink.com. Oh my God, Julian. Because Dominic had some foreth- forethought to this trip and he knew that if he had gotten his Wink subscription, he would have gotten Julian. wine delivered to his house and he could have had it on a plane. Now, I will not say that planes will allow you to bring full bottles of wine from Wink, <laughs> but you will wish that you could bring your Wink bottles onto the plane. What? Wink.trywink.com slash Jenna Julian, guys. <laughs> Trywink.com slash Jenna and Julian, sorry, uh, or click the link in the description. It's much easier. But yeah, the, the URL is trywink, T-R-Y-W-I-N-C dot com slash Jenna and Julian for $20 off. Guys, uh, there's no membership fees. You skip any month, cancel any time, and shipping is complimentary, okay? Uh, it is an awesome service, basically, where wine experts take a flavor profile you fill out and select wine. They're experts. They know what they're doing. They select wine that they know you'll like, and they send it to your house. All you have to do is fill out the... Wink's special palette profile quiz. They send wine directly to your door. And if you don't like a bottle they send to you, they'll replace it with a bottle you'll love. No questions asked. I mean, how do you get a better deal there? Check it out, guys. Click the link in the, in the description. You will uh, definitely like it. Also, guys, I never get excited about underwear unless I'm talking about MeUndies because MeUndies is the only underwear I wear. And I think you should check it out if you have not. They're fun, comfy undies that feel as good as they look. They have new designs of really, really cool patterns and prints every single month. Uh, Once you put on a pair, you get it. You just get it because it's better than any underwear you've worn. Mm -hmm. Trust. Um, I also love not having to go to the store. MeUndies sends underwear right to your door, okay, in a beautiful little package with a new design. It's so cool. Um, But if designs aren't for you, they have plain prints. They have all sorts of different types of underwear. They even have bralettes and socks now. Um, and if you're not sure, well, Mandy's can, uh, nudge you in the right direction. Okay. Cause you get 20 for 20% off your first pair of Mandy's free shipping and satisfaction guarantee. When you go to meundies.com slash Jenna Julian, uh, or click the link in the description, guys, you will not be sorry. You just won't. 
Thank you, sponsors, both longtime sponsors and support parents of the podcast. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, you order a Scotch Rocks. I think we should order a Yeah, Scotch I think Rocks. we should order a drink. Ah, the calming effects of alcohol. Dangerous to every organ in the body, yet so effective on, effective on the limbic system. You feel instantly relaxed as the liquid goes down your throat and warms your belly. Brings a pleasant flush to your cheeks. You sit back in the plush seats and enjoy the flight. At some point, you doze off and are awakened at JFK Airport by Leon shaking you. You get up and leave the plane. You're As you're in first class, you two are the first... Of the first to deplane, having no luggage, you head immediately to the exit. Outside, you breathe in the incomparable smells of New York. Pollution mixed with the scents of fresh bagels from every corner vendor uh, permeate the air. People stride and even run past around you, uh, jostling you slightly with their movements. Eat, that's very accurate. <laughs> Uh, each has a place that they have to go and need to go now. Fixed faces and featureless eyes focused on the destination. The intensity and purpose of, in New Yorkers have always pleased and comforted you. Uh, how very different from the slow, easy pace of um, affable familiarity of Midwestern, yet a welcome change. Particularly uh, since you enjoy an anonymity here um, that is present nowhere else. Leon hails a cab and you both get in. We're going to Brooklyn, 15th Avenue, he tells the cab. You stare out the window and hope Stacy's okay. Sleeping on the plane has restored your endurance to its maximum. Oh, hell yeah. Our endurance back up there, bitch. To Leon's apartment. The cab pulls up at the curb. You get out. Leon pays the driver and walks ahead of you. Fishing for his key in his left pocket, he his height rivals yours, but his frame is a bit lankier. Striding towards the door, his right hand scratches the jet black stubble at the top of his head. As he is a bit ahead of you and uh, has just entered the lobby, Leon doesn't notice you, the dwarf who accosted you. Perhaps four feet tall, about five feet wide, the creature is absolutely filthy. His face lined and weathered. A huge bushy red beard covers his face, and you two can on- and you can only see two bright spots where his eyes peer out of, as you at, at you from under an equally thick bushy eyebrows. Two ax- uh, two axes are tethered to his belt, one on each side of his thick waist. He looked like he doesn't belong in this world. We got no time, boy. My name be Corgan. I know who you be. You got the symbols given to me. And me king will be pleased. I got something for you. He hefts a small piece of stone in his callous hands and eyeing you meaningfully. You have one option. It's to ignore the dwarf and enter Leon's room. What the fuck? That's not a good term, is it? Yeah, that's. I think that's derogatory. It well, it also sounds like he's having a hallucination. Maybe. There are at least three computers in this room, all functional and humming quietly. Leon falls into his high back leather swivel chair and flips out his phone, pushing a speed dial number. Ray, what's up, dickbag? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come here. We're doing it tonight. Yeah, tonight. Slight pause. Okay, I'll see you soon. Leon hangs up. Glancing at the wall clock, you see it's 1.05 a.m. The flight was two and a half hours. You lost an hour going to the East Coast, not to mention getting all the way to Brooklyn from JFK. You sit on Leon's bed and wait for Ray. All three of, the three of you were inseparable until you and Leon both descended into hardcore drug abuse and distribution, at which point Ray wisely jumped ship. However, he has never ceased to be your good friend. You would trust him with your life, and tonight, apparently, you shall. Leon's cell phone rings to alert him of Ray's arrival. Leon buzzes him in. Oh, fuck, dude. It's going down. Ray walks into Leon's room uh, as though he's been in the apartment a hundred times before, uh, and in fact, he has. He and Leon grew up together. Leon in this very house. The only difference is the arrangements, as Leon now pays the rent and buys the necessities. Ray is perhaps 5'9", 190 pounds, not obese, but rather stocky and solid-looking. He's an Italian-Hispanic mix with black hair, fair skin, and a strong jaw. Ray is the most polite of all of you, even with an even temperament, slow to lose control, and yet a terror to behold when he has been roused to anger. You hug him roughly and pat his cheek. Good to see you again, man. You too, he replies. So we're really going to do it, Leon nods. We're really going to do it? Leon nods. Ray's motivation are probably loyalty, as he would not normally become enmeshed in anything this dangerous and illegal. Leon leaves the room momentarily, and at that moment, Ray gives you a peculiar look, as though he wants to tell you something but can't. The moment is gone, and Leon returns to the room. Okay, my mom's asleep. He pulls an old army chest out of his bed, out from under his bed, unlocks it, and throws it open with some relish. Choose one, and then we'll decide on a plan. Three weapons are thrown haphazardly at the bottom. Whoa! A Mossberg 500 Persuader shotgun. Oh my god. Looks like a double pump. No, it looks like a pump shotgun. Um, a Heckler and Cost MP5. It's like an SMG. Or a dual Beretta 92Fs. Pistols. So we take the SMG. Yeah, let's do it. They're OP. Okay, when you've made your choice, use the weapon. Okay, use it. I think you have to use it in your inventory. 
Liu Zaiden. You reach for the Heckler MP5, but Leon knocks your hand away. Either of the other ones. I want the H and K, fucko. Leon glares at you as though daring you to reach for it again. He's not worth the trouble, so you examine your other options. So you have to take the handguns or the shotgun? Mm -hmm. What do you want? Shotgun. Let's take it. Use it. You, oh you have the Mossberg 500 shotgun and smile at its comforting weight and famed reliability. Whoa. Leon hands you a case of shells, which you methodically insert into the weapon, finally pumping it once to load the first shell. Ray grabs the dual Berettas and Leon picks up the MP5. Go over the plan or change your mind and choose a different weapon. No, let's go over the plan. Let's go over. We're a weapon master. We're going to be fine. We, okay. we got to kill somebody. This is fucked up, but we're going to be fine. By the way, this is not a normal podcast. If this is the first time you're watching our podcast, this is not a normal podcast. We decided, <laughs> I mean, I honestly didn't know that this would be this long, but I am. Um, you I'm might not be able to finish it. Yeah, there's a chance. I mean, I don't know. Cause that, I don't have no idea when the end is. Yeah. So, but like, because I looked up like some reviews on it and none of them were like, this, this is like a five hour thing. So I just assumed that it would be. Why don't we see where it goes in the next couple minutes? And if we have to go part two on another podcast, we'll do that. Mm. I'm into it, though. I think it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. Having chosen your weapons, Leon and Ray gather around the bed as Leon unfolds a large piece of paper. Okay, I've never been to Serge's house, but I have associates who have. One of them was willing, well paid, to draw me up a blueprint of the property. I'm thinking all three of us should kick in the front door and start killing. They're not expecting anything, and there won't be more five of them, more than five of them, including Serge. I thought you said there could be five, six, no more than ten, Leon, you ask. Ray looks at Leon for confirmation of this possibility. Nah, fuck, there'll be more than five, and we'll have the element of surprise. The three of us open fire, and everybody dies. Ray looks a bit skeptical, but we'll follow your lead. What about around back? Wouldn't that be better, you ask? Yeah, it would, but Serge has got a pit bull. He sleeps out back somewhere. He's not tra He's not a trained attack dog or anything, but I have heard he's huge and he doesn't like anybody but Serge. Oh, puppy dog. What about the fence? You poke your finger at the diagram. How are we going to get past that? Dude, I don't even know why he drew that. It's just a regular fence. We can jump, jump it. Leon rolls his eyes. Lies. Leon rolls his eyes. <laughs> what will it be then? Oh, we'll take the blueprint if you want it. Studying the map, you decide that. All three of you will kick in the front door to open fire. All three of you will creep down the alleyway and sneak in back. Two of you will sneak around back and one of you will go straight to the front. Uh, if you wish to use your weapon master trait, click here. If you w wish to use your sixth sense trait, click here. Oh, I definitely want to use one of our senses. Let's use the weapon master. Okay. Or, I mean, I don't know. Sixth sense might allow us to figure out the best way to get into the house mm. because I don't think that splitting up would be a good choice. No, I think you need to stay together. Yeah, but... I wonder what Weapon Master... Isn't that just like our, our trait? Like, why would we use that? Right yeah. Now? Let's use Sixth Sense. Or I don't know. I don't know either. Well, let's take the blueprint. Okay. Let's use Sixth Sense. Okay. Your six, you sense that splitting up oh, would be shit. best. Oh, so okay. you're wrong. But only if you could somehow take care of the pit bull that looks around back. Unfortunately, your Sixth Sense tell you nothing more than this. Thinking about how to stop a pit bull, you consider drugs, depressants to be more exact, quiet, and effective. Oh no, we about to drug a dog. Go back and We're make a decision. terrible person. Yeah, go back and make or a decision. Or we can tell Leon our thoughts and ask him if he has anything of use. Oh yeah, tell Leon your thoughts. All right, we tell him. Leon, do you have a needle? No, fucko, I stopped that shit a long time ago. He glances at Ray and you give, and, and you, um, man, this is important. I know you're still using, I can tell by your eyes. Give me a fucking syringe and some heroin. Leon sighs and puts a, pulls a clean needle and a small packet out of a toolbox next to his computer. Fine, here. Ray starts to get angry, but you quiet him. This is too important. We can use this thing on the dog. Oh, God. Shooting him would be loud, and I don't want to kill a dog anyway. You dump a bit of heroin. Doesn't want to kill a dog, but wants to kill a person. Mm. What the hell right, is so going we take on? The heroin We're bad syringe. people. This is bad. All right. So you think that you your sixth sense says splitting up would be best. So Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. I want to use our weapon master trait, too, because now we're back at the screen. Where okay, we let's also. do that. Okay. Unfortunately, your endurance is not high enough to effectively use your weapon master trait. What? Damn. Okay. All three of you will kick in the front door and open fire? No. All three of you will creep around the alleyway and sneak him back. Two of you. So we'll do two of you sneak around back, one mm -hmm. go to the front. Yep. That's our only choice that requires us <clears throat> to split up. Two of us should sneak around back and another goes in the, in the front door. Best combination of stealth and assault. Ray shrugs. But looks a bit vexed. Leon says, I don't know, fucko. We should probably stick together. I'm telling you, man. Splitting up is the best idea. Leon and Ray mutter. Finally, Ray speaks up. I don't know, Dom. I think we should stick together. It's not like I want to bust into someone's house and kill people with weapons. If we're going to do this, we need to do it together. So you have to go back and make a new plan. Okay. It's your only option. 
I guess he just busted in the front door. No, we're going to creep down the alleyway and sneak in the back because oh, that's where the dog the, is. Yeah, okay. yeah. Let's go in the back. I don't think surprise will be enough if we go through the front. Ray nods. But Leon says, whatever, pussy, just because Ray thinks it's a good idea, idea too, I'll do it. He sighs dramatically. The three of you creep from Leon's room, careful not to awake his mother. Downstairs, Leon leads you to a beat-up Volvo. <clears throat> its color is dull white due to the dirt and grime covering the ancient paint job. The three of you get in, Leon at the wheel, and drive to Serge's house. Pulling up to the curb, Leon cuts the engine about two blocks away. Okay, we jump the fence, creep around the back porch, and kick in the door. Kill anybody else you see and watch out oh for the God. pit bull. <coughs> you and Ray nod. <clears throat> Your palms feel sweaty and your anxiety is rising, but no amount of Ativan would help at this point. Well, some would, but you don't. You need to be as sharp as possible. The outskirts of Serge's property. The three of you climb up and jump down, cringing as the fence makes a small amount of noise. You sprint down the gravel path towards Serge's house. Even from here, you can hear explosions coming from inside the house and loud yelling, despite any absence of light. There is a house to the left of Serge's and some sort of ha store to the right, but they sit quiet and motionless, without any lights of any kind. Crouch, you can all move even closer to the house. You creep down the alleyway to the back porch. The alleyway is quiet and very, very dark. There are no street lights around, and you strain your eyes to make your way to the backyard. In less than a minute, the three of you come out of the alley and look around. The backyard. The backyard is quiet. The porch light casts a long shadow over the yard, and you can barely make out a wooden doghouse directly to your left, about 10 feet from the back porch. You aren't sure, but you think you see a dog lying with its nose out the front of the doghouse, probably asleep, as he certainly would have started barking if he had detected you. Afraid to speak, you motion towards the dog, but Ray and Leon show they see it too, eyes widening with recognition and a small nod of their heads. With its prop, prop propinquity prop to the porch, that's such an unnecessary word, with it being <laughs> close to the porch, you doubt you could sneak, sneak up on the porch without awaking to the, uh, the dog. Besides, you can't tell who's inside the back of the house from this distance and who might be looking out. Better option would be to creep up and somehow put the dog out of commission, but only if you could do it quietly. The loud sounds are still coming from the house. You change your mind and go around the front. You motion for Leon and Ray to wait and then carefully sneak up to the pit bull or you try to sneak up to the porch anyway. We should sneak up to the pit bull. That was our plan. Mm -hmm. Ever so quietly, you approach the pit bull, your eyes never leaving its closed ones. As you approach, it snorts and adjusts itself. The creature is obviously not very vigilant, but you cringe at these movements. Now within an arm reach of the dog, you consider your option. Maybe this wasn't such an idea, a good idea. Creep back to Leon and Ray. Can we use the syringe? Use item. We use item. Very slowly, you pull the syringe out of your pocket and uncap, that is, uncap it so the needle is exposed. Utterly, you're focused on your task. You bend it in closer to the pit. You bend in closer to the pit. When you're close enough to smell his breath, you simultaneously grab his collar and ram the needle into his neck, depressing oh. the plunger as quickly as possible. The dog's oh. eyes flip, flick open and instinctively wrenches away from you and yelps quietly, pulling towards it causing, and causing you to sprawl on top of him. He tries to shrug you off, but quickly goes limp. You hurry off and, and back up, but he's not moving. The needle is still protruding from his neck. Very carefully, you examine the dog. He's still breathing and his eyes are still open. He'll be all right. Though you doubt he'll be barking for another couple of hours. Satisfied. Oh, that's so fucked up. Yeah. Satisfied that you were both successful and you didn't permanently damage the dog, you moved to Leon and Ray. I can't believe that shit worked. All right, let's get on the porch and kill these fuckers. Back Jeez. porch. Creeping on the back porch, you, you peek through the screen door, straining down to the hallway. Straining to see down the hallway into the living room, Leon and Ray wait directly behind you out of view of the door. They are kneeling quietly and their silence is broken only by Leon taking the safety off the MP5 due to the, due to the ruckus within. You can see the gigantic television in the living room, but nothing else. The television blares the sounds of gunshots and violence and people are cheering and cursing at each other good-natured inside the room. They play in PUBG. Probably. You whisper the solution to Leon and Ray. Situation. Uh, if you wish to use your weapon master trait, click here. Let's try, but I don't think we have yeah. endurance. Wait. Yeah. Yeah, we don't. Damn. Let's go rushing down the hall and open fire. We have the element of surprise. We might have the element of surprise, but let's creep in. Creep in. All right, what what are you going to do? Run in there with your clompy clomp feet? You That's whisper, not a good idea. Yeah, you need to be, I mean, you come this far creepy. Why would yeah. you expose yourself? You whisper to Leon and Ray that you should all sneak in and then creep from the master bath to the master bedroom, making sure no one in the kitchen on, is in the kitchen on its way. Um, if all your rooms are clear, you, you can rush the living room. You sneak in. Creeping down the hallway, peeking into the kitchen and bathroom, you see no one. Entering the living room, you see that the Russians have been completely taken off guard. 
Um, without hesitation, you fire the Mossberg into one of the Russians. It's a surprised look in his eyes. He lays back on the couch. Oh my God. He, he lays against the back of the couch and lets out a tremendous sigh, then sits unmoving. The other three have already tossed their controllers and picked up AK-47 assault rifle. Oh, shit. Leon unleashes with the MP5, spraying the room. He manages to riddle two of the men with bullets, but not before one has fired at you, his bullets tearing into the wallpaper and ending your left shoulder. Oh. The remaining Russian tries to run for the back of the room, but Ray fires his Berettas into the, his back, blowing his body forward and lay unmoving on the tiled hallway. Smiling, Leon moves over to his corpse and in the hallway and spits on it. There you go, Serge. You fuck. Then a strange thing happens. Leon turns and open <gasps> fires on Ray, who has already lowered his weapon. Ray's body twitches spasmodically with the bullets. His oh extremities dancing like a puppet on a string. A moment later, he collapses, his belly so mutilated that his intestines ooze onto the floor like questing worms. Confusion sets in. What is going on? Leon points his weapon at you. Drop it, fucko. You consider he screams louder. Drop it or I'll kill you now. I swear to God, drop your weapon. Now kick it towards me. Leon angrily, you kick, Leon says angrily, you kick the weapon towards him. Isn't, is this how you repay a friend? You ask bitterly, Leon sighs. I didn't want it to be this way, you know. He pauses. You know why Ray came along on this thing? His eyes with consideration. No, you reply sullenly. He came along because he didn't want to tell you something. Because he wanted to tell you something, fuck back. He wanted to tell you that the cops have been asking him questions lately. He was our friend, and I stupidly told him what we did all those years ago. He didn't say anything, but he knew. Oh, he knew. Knew what? Knew that only you and he could finger me, get me put away. Uh, Leon arches his eyebrows and looks at you meaningfully. So you fucking killed him? You yell. Spittle flying from your lips. He couldn't be trusted, and neither can I. After, after I said I'd help you, you fuck. Leon laughs. Hey, I trust both of you to a certain extent, and I needed you. I couldn't have taken Serge's gang by myself, but with both of you and Serge dead, I don't have to worry about a thing. He raises the MP5 to the level of your chest. Sorry, fucko. Leon pulls the trigger. Nothing happens. You realize the gun is jammed. The gun's fucking jammed. If you're going to do something, do it now. What? Throw the condom at him. We have no options other than unable to think of anything. Leon fixes the MP5 and unloads 20 rounds into your head. Should we use the condom? <laughs> yeah, use, use the condom. <laughs> well, maybe, but not quite what I had in mind. Unfortunately, pocket that monstrosity and continue onwards. Damn. Looks like we're going to... Okay. Oh, cell phone. Use item. We got to use everything we have, right? Okay, try it. Thinking quickly, you pull out your phone and whip it at Leon, striking him in the head. The blow dazes him momentarily, and you grab the Mossberg and level it at him. Oh, shit. That worked. Now you drop it, fucko, or I'll make your head disappear, you say evenly. Leon looks in your eyes and sees that you're dead serious. He drops the MP5. Listen, don't kill me. I'm sorry about it. He begins. You're sorry? You're fucking sorry? You just killed our best friend in cold blood, and you're sorry? I have to kill you, don't you see? Please, Dom, don't kill me. I swear. I. He pleads. Shut the fuck up. You scream at him. Shut the fuck up. I don't want to hear your lies anymore. You hear a voice whispering that if you let him live, he'll come after you. That he killed your best friend and deserves and deserves vengeance no one will know you can escape clean and end this horrible past for all time um all you have to do is pull this trigger it's time to make a decision kill him or spare him i don't know he was just about to kill us okay then kill him okay then do it all right we kill him shoot him in the face of the mossberg whoa thinking of all the pain leon has caused you empty the mossberg into his head and chest your face cold your eyes distant but inside something is laughing as leon's eyes explode and the shell mutilates his flesh <gasps> Ew. with a horrified expression on his face he oh. falls to the living room floor Sur searching surgeon and the other russians you come up with nearly five thousand cash pocketing it you take one last look at leon before turning away you walk over to ray and brush his hair from his face sorry ray if only i'd known thank you kissing your finger and placing it against his cheek briefly that moment marks the end of your sanity. Oh, shit. Slinging the Mossberg over your shoulder, you pick up Ray's Beretta, stash him in your pants, and head for the front door. Cop sirens scream in the distance, but you stride serenely to the car, even chuckling a bit to yourself. What? So you've lost it. You're not wanted in Missouri. At least I hope you aren't. But you, but you know you can never go back. You practice your... You, your practice, your relationship with Stacy, your whole life there is finished. Killing Serge and his army is one thing, but killing a friend, a defenseless one at that, was the, straw, the last straw on your sanity. A cold and brutal creature you become, unfit for normal life. NYC is no longer home either, as both of your friends are dead. Getting into Leon's car, where he left the keys for a quick getaway, you rev the engine and speed off into the night, failing to find your destiny. <coughs> you did well. I think we finished. You did well, and perhaps you will find it extremely frustrating to find out that without the, 
talisman, you cannot continue. You cannot end this story or any story if your destiny is unfulfilled. What? And unfulfilled it is. This web of lies leads to another. And without being able to follow that strand, everything is meaningless. The breakdown. A hundred out of a hundred, your level of psychosis. <laughs> we went nuts, fam. We lost our mind completely. Zero out of ten, our psychedelic state. I don't know what that means. Like we're not, we weren't high or something. We stayed sober the whole time, maybe. No, that last one is sobriety. Oh, 95 out of 100, your level of sobriety. So we pretty much were sober the whole time, except for the plane. Your total score is 659 out of 1,000. Your title is, I try my best. You achieved no ending because the universe refuses to let you progress. You are asleep and this story, but a dream and a greater reality you cannot fathom. Wow. Wait, click on try, try again. That's that's the only thing that it says. And then it takes you back to the beginning. Are you kidding me? Wow, dude. Okay. That was really fun and cool. But like That was now I'm in a like a time suck where I feel like I want to play it again until we get it right. I kinda do too. Because there are so many different points where we could have done different things. Damn, that's super Wait, so, fun though. So when uh, Ray looked at you in the apartment before you went to do the raid, like he was trying to tell you like he knew mm -hmm. and he wanted to help or he wanted to like help by letting you know. But Leon has always been fucking nuts, dude. Because he's still, you're sober, but Leon's clearly not. He had heroin needles in his apartment. Dude, that shit was crazy. Wow. What a journey it has been. My goodness. Damn, dude. The well, MVP of that story is the pit bull flow for sure. Yeah. Poor guy. Poor guy. Hopefully he'll be okay. I can only hope so. Fuck Dom. Fuck Ray. Fuck Leon. Hopefully the pit bull's okay. It's a pretty cool thing to do. Like if you guys ever want to go on that website and play those games. It's like, it's really fun. It is fun. I liked it a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's. I knew it was gonna be long, but it did feel like at times you're like, "Where is this going?" You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because especially like the way they detail certain things, like they they're spending a whole page detailing a room that you're just like, "Okay, yeah." Like I get it, it's gray. Yeah, <laughs> you know. But no, it was cool. If it, it felt like, um, damn, I want to know what like we could have done immersive. to make it better. Probably not be a piece of shit. So if you if you think we hadn't ran from the cops, this would have we would have been better. Off. Probably. What would you think would have happened? I don't know. You, you probably would have gone to work, still had that running with Antonio because he was still a loose end. That's fine. We wouldn't have killed him. No, you, but he probably would have still punched you. That's fine. But then. I don't know. I don't oh, know. Oh, but remember, Leon got into your apartment because Stacy was gone. Stacy's gone. She's got it going on. That's not right. Yeah, I definitely shouldn't have run from the cops. But honestly, if you ask me if I want to run from the cops in a story like this, like, come on, just, just got to do it. <laughs> um, we'll link the site below. But um, It's really uh, fun. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. I know this was a bit different pacing and such from our normal podcast, but hopefully you guys liked it. And also, I know that a lot of you guys like this stuff and have better, you know, stories and sites. So share them, please, because we're up for doing more of these if you guys are keen. Yeah, it's fun. Well... We fucked up and we died. We, we stayed sober, though. A Virgo Kids, and an Aries, they just can't make it through this story. Kids, just stay sober and everything will end up being horrific. Oh, and, and everything, everybody Julian, dies. It's not a valuable lesson. Just get, lose your mind. Okay. Well, have a great week. <laughs> don't, go, don't go insane. And, um, and yeah. No drugs and no violence and stay hydrated. All right. Good night and good luck. Bye. <laughs>